clay they caution, dust to dust they intone. From earth you came and to earth you will return, they admonish. They remind us we are mortal and subject to death, yet insist on their eternals. Demons and angels, paradise or purgatory, merely human with a finite measure of days. But we have exploded as novas, burned through galaxies, explored far reaches of the Milky Way, ridden on the tails of comets, danced on the edge of asteroids until, in a dizzying frenzy of passion, we fell through the viscous ozone, past cooling clouds to settle in the ooze that feeds the ocean's fluid. It was there that we decided to grow limbs and tongue all the while holding inside the truth of our origin, magnesium, calcium, iron. We are the stuff that stars are made of. It's a scientific fact, a cosmic truth. In ignorance and in knowing, we hold grains of the divine inside ourselves. And we always have. I just want to say that today is like no other. Poetry coming out of this space is just amazing. Thank you. Please welcome to Rita McHale, the author of the full length book of poetry, Synchronicity, the Oracle of Sun Medicine, published by Nomadic Press in 2020. Let's give a warm welcome for to Rita. I wanted to say thank you for inviting me. And it's always, wow, it feels the filling of the soul, the feeling of the soul to hear us. And um, boy, Ayadeles, Stajabu, I mean, these are women um, and Devor, I mean, go back, go way back and just uh, the poetry, the styles, the listening. Okay, giving thanks, giving thanks. So um, this is a piece about um, someone who had to overcome some things. So she remembers her tenure on the third planet of her highness and says, uh, and I hadn't run in circle when three years old on fields of grass with blackbird chasing me or me chasing it. If I hadn't remembered reoccurring dream at seven years of age, swallowing small stones, choking under bright sky in front of a long dark tunnel holding pinpoint light. If my body hadn't heaved and cried that day in 1989, recalling what happened 17 years prior with the chemistry professor who said I could not use the problem solving methods of Africans with whom I studied because they were going back to Africa, I was not. If I hadn't experienced migraines while studying for three exams, looking for subjects connectedness within a circle, reading a book given me titled Moon To and find a quote that read, for the African to disengage one subject from life's circle would paralyze the rest and have migraines disappear shortly thereafter. If I hadn't been haunted by small globular lights, Van Ellen belts, solid gold, lime, purple spheres, amassing iridescent lights that would suddenly appear and learn interdimensional beings do exist. If I hadn't been awakened by a tiger watching me calmly in a dream, heard a spirit come down the roof through the ceiling and feel its weighted impression sit beside me. If I hadn't called and talked to a Zen Buddhist priest for two hours who assured me I was not going mad, nor had I committed a sin, but was merely entering my enlightenment. If I hadn't been commissioned to have my astrology chart calculated five times, aligning on earth as it is in heaven, interpreting my idea of an active noun verb agreement system. 
if I hadn't recognized while studying organic and inorganic chemistry that iron is not only a common element found in the body, but throughout the universe causing life to be pulled or repelled in some way. If I hadn't attended the Berkeley Psychic Institute, learned how one can absorb another's programming, get invited to Stanford's parapsychology department with BPI and discover trans mediums who allowed a spirit to share her body, then discover another at my job. If I hadn't witnessed a slug sized lip suctioning leech undulate around a relative's head as though looking for a place to land. And when it did, weeks later, relative could not lift her head. If I hadn't suggested she see a Chinese acupuncturist who said at the end of the examination, it is as though something has sucked the life force from her head, which left me questioning what I saw. If I hadn't read in the archeology span of knowledge, we must also ascribe to the institutional sites from which the doctor makes his discourse. If I hadn't worked in a mental institution as a lab tech and learned the difference between a psychic and a sick psychic, if I hadn't heard the birds crying song while napping, unable to discern how I knew their cry only to get up and open the door and see birds fluttering wildly over a lifeless friend. A door, if I hadn't read in the newspaper, if I hadn't read helicopter, seen the helicopter fly over my house, drop something on the house at the corner, that sounded like a loud swoosh. May 13th, 1985, after 2 a.m. on the West Coast, if I hadn't read in the newspaper later that same morning that the helicopter that dropped something, dropped a bomb on the MOVE organization's house on the corner of Osage and Pine in Philadelphia on the East Coast, at 5 a.m. and noted a three hour time difference if I hadn't felt a patient's medication in his right eye, on my left eye, and associated molecular isomers mirroring molecules. If I hadn't seen rainbows near sun in clear skies as if to illume answers to questioned insight. If I hadn't been pulled outside to bow my head, point to the vastness of the night sky and at the tip of my finger, have a shooting star arrive. If I hadn't awakened abruptly from sleep and see Isis, Greeks call Sirius, watch over me. If I hadn't heard a voice say, you have fidelity in the law and it will be used as your trench. I might not have recognized my ancestors saying, I come from mystics who believe in hearing the inaudible touching the intangible and seeing the invisible. Thank you. Thank you. I, what is so wonderful about today with poems like yours, Adele's, Lynn Lawson's, everyone's, is there something that we can relate to? There is something that brings together the past, the present, the future, and the experiences of being African and African-American in the Americas and beyond. Thank you. Yes. We have just two wonderful poets left. Um, oh, three, excuse me. Our next one is the, just, I wanna say I, I discovered Michael, I, I'm sure everyone has known about in this group particularly, knows about his work, but I had the pleasure of reading uh, Michael's work probably in about the last year and his his latest book of poetry poetry uh, and protest of poetry and protest from Emmett Till to Trayvon Martin is something that everyone should own a copy of because it tells the stories in such poetic terms of being black in a country that is still working through its racism. I'd like you all to give a warm welcome 
to Michael Ward. Hi, Michael. Hey, Kim. And thank you for including me in this groundbreaking series. I wrote this first poem in the late 80s uh, for a theater production at Live Bait Theater in Chicago. It's called, Is Jordy an Anti-Hero or Just a Smart Black Guy in Space? It's so simple, I could cry, but I have no eyes. Behind these bars, my sockets bulge with implants of boiled platypus eggs. Conceptually, it's so crude, still effective as any blunt instrument bashing in the collective skull. I'm allowed to be brilliant as long as my solutions are for someone else. My formulation saving the enterprise crew and not misusing the ship's computer banks to calculate why are there so few black people in space? I never take the existence of blacks in space for granted. In the purest production of the Lucas prophecies, the future existed without me. The voice of Darth Vader was the voice of James Earl, but who but us paid attention to that? I pondered the prospect of space genocide. Our resurrection took on the image of Billy D, space rogue, French for criminal. All God's spades wear dark shades, a late 20th century poet wrote. Willie Horton wore shades, the anti-hero of his time. The Crips on America's Most Wanted wore, wore them, they think I can see through quantum singularities and not see through this shit? If something else is wrong with me, then my intellect is not subversive. Could be a loss of legs, a shattered eardrum, an arm devoured by leprosy, a periodic collapse into the criminal mind, a defect symbolizing defected people, a pivotal role as fundamental as matter and antimatter, and possibly as volatile. There are no heroes without anti-heroes. We make heroes so much more heroic. I worked as a foreign correspondent in my early 20s, based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And my attention at the time as a journalist was myopic, unless the subject was revolution, liberation, reconstruction, war, or famine, I ignored it. And when I visited the ancient rock hue churches and other religious artifacts in Ethiopia, I was in the space at the time, but intellectually, I was absent. This is a poem in progress. It's called Back to the Ark, Aksum, Ethiopia, 1978 to 2020. When I return, I will leave my dogma at the door of Aksum's church of Our Lady Mary of Zion. I will surrender to my once innocent curiosity of all the things I do not know. I will revel at the rarity of existing inside this ancient kingdom's presence, now knowing where I walk. I will revere the gray-haired guardian of the Ark of the Covenant despite his frail monkish frame and seemingly antiquated weaponry. I will see, repl I will see replicas of sacred tablets in Lalabella's rock-hewn wonders as 3,000-year-old tether technology serving a mystical mainframe. I will interpret accounts of angels carving the red volcanic rock monoliths under moonlight as visitation of sculpting Afronauts. I will acknowledge that the wisest place to hide an Arcadia tree is in a forest of 20,000 houses of worship I will read the Gia's liturgical symbols and carved on the King Izana stone as African code for knowledge not yet stolen. I will stand before the crowns of Menelik in awe this time, contemplating what power they wield under past and future revolutions around the sun. I will blaspheme for a moment against historical materialism while transversing back through time, I will speculate. Another of my Africa poems um, based on my photography in Mali 
and for my third book of poems, uh, The Armageddon of Funk. Uh, it's called Pounding in Mali. Obsidian arms, savanna smooth, smash grain into African atoms to swallow. Wooden accelerators break matter down into beats between polyrhythms. Visions of Malian women elongated, their splendor blazing and illuminated. Towers of grace, they encircle the west that erodes their village, pounding ancient particles into quarks of sound. And I think I have time for one more. I am thrilled that my mentor, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, has become a part of the Afro futurist conversation. Uh, many of us have been influenced by her. And this last poem also from the 80s is her, it's, um, called Her Words to Gwendolyn Brooks. It's also in my book, The Armageddon of Funk. An archeologist, not a lexicologist, figured it out. The word was a woman mingling among the aromos of Ethiopia Brandishing a painter's brush in a dig territorially defined by string. The archaeologist swept away ancient crust and sediment, finding language alive and agitated instead of the fossilized femur of a long dead Ramaphysicus. Words wrapped in rhythm, pleasure, knowledge, and pain. Words as sharply defined as an Ashanti sculpture. Words of an African dynasty made of peoples not restricted to kings. Words that survived the Atlantic, words that survived the Atlanta, words that survived migration, segregation, integration, and false resolution. Words worn as bracelets, amulets, and weapons. Words that were up long before they were down. Word up. Words that give more than she has taken. Children's lives reweave first of her poems and then through their own words that could weave a world. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Michael. That was just beautiful. That's just beautiful. Well, we have, we're coming to the end of what I consider an historic event, um, just by the fact that these beautiful voices are gathered here today. Our next poet that I'd like you to welcome is Avacha. She's a poet, a playwright, multi-percussionist, and a popular Bay Area DJ and radio personality, and the leader of the group, Avacha and Modouple. I'd like you to give a warm welcome for Avacha. Hi, hi Avacha. I'm, I'm, hi, I'm so I'm in awe. You know, uh, everybody, I'm so old friends here and, and some new friends of people I haven't seen before and I'm grateful to be in the company of and honored to be in the company of um, because I refuse to be typecast. I was talking on Friday with both uh, Glenn Paris and uh, Ishmael Reed and we were talking about Afrofuturism and we all said the same thing about refusing to be typecast. So I want to do two very different poems but uh, similar in one way. My heart is bleeding right now. People complaining about the pandemic and being stuck in the house this is something never had to happen. I'm older than dirt. And I remember when I was a kid hearing scientists talking about if you do so and so, such and such is going to happen. Well, such and such has happened. I'm so grateful that we have people like uh, the youngsters in Relief here in Oakland who are planting trees all over the place because what's happening now is something the, that is born of complete greed and stupidity. So anyway, this first piece I thought I would read is by my father, Papa used to always say it was uh, Hibara de la Ciudad, which means a city country girl. This is called A Simple Freedom or Was It Just a Dream? Once upon a time when the world was green, when this earth was heaven, the trees used to sing to us and we sang their praises, danced in honor of their beauty and reveled in the millions of gifts they gave us. Life was a simple but complicated symphony when lovesick leaves sang and romance hungry wind spirits and clouds pregnant with the promise of tomorrow kept us drunk on the sweet wine of her rings. Then came the invasion. Wood eating devils that make termites look like angels. The lakes 
the streams, the green, all gone, forests of dreams destroyed, the simple beauty of millions of yesterdays eaten by greed and lifelessly regurgitated into the ravaged soil as echoes of green cry in the shadows of what once was. Tree spirits hidden behind ancestral tombstones, their seedless offspring roam thirsty deserts beside invisible uprooted generations, trying to remember days when nature reigned and all her green gave the world oxygen to breathe and got the world drunk on the fruit of their love. Days when trees romanced the clouds and rain was the wine of heaven. Now their ghosts silently scream, wide awake nightmares, restless spirits hidden in the sands of a long ago time, a time before they came. They came like an atonal swarm of hungry locusts, suicidal wood-eating demons that looked like angels but took joy in the devastation of uprooted generations, in the destruction of sacred medicinal flowers that once perfumed the air now. The lakes, the streams, the green all gone. In their place grow tearful memories, crying echoes dancing in the weeds with hurricanes and earthquakes, shadows of days when this earth was heaven when happiness was being able to safely lie in the grass and just breathe and be serenaded by a chorus of singing frogs and birds. It was a simple priceless freedom. Or was it just a dream? Once upon a time when the world was green. Um, this uh, second one is called Matter Is. Um, and um, it's in my book, uh, uh, with every step I take. Oh, no, it's not in that book. It's coming out in the next book, it's a, which is Oakland uh, Mosaic. Um, anyway, it's um, something I think because human beings, as someone said earlier, and, and part of the thing, human beings are such arrogant creatures. And um, assuming, you know, everybody was the first and all this kind of nonsense. But anyway, so this is matter is. We were there long before it all began. There before the cataclysmic blast, we watched as part of the electrifying charge that set this life as we know it in motion. We were there. And the spinning of our spirits involuntarily assisted in the birth of the first stars. We helped with the placement of constellations and orchestrated the arrangement of Saturn, Uranus, and the geometrical precision of Orion's belt and the radiant consistency of Jupiter, Pluto, and Mars. We were there. I say we were there awestruck riding inside the inner heart of the soul of dreams through the heavenly medicine of the Milky Way, listening, 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 witnessing the beginning of it all. Brazen cosmic peep freaks in the center of the miraculous. We were the free in freedom before the division of the sexes, before love was kidnapped and romance commodified. We danced and danced before roles were written in stone and my spirit danced around yours. I was unrestrainable and we were too big to be contained. We were the real deal, the real definition of the meaning of what love is supposed to be about you and me. Two sides of the same vibration, compatible opposites in a harmonious composite of the true unification of the one. We, we were there and, and here and, and we were everywhere all at the same time, little microscopic infinitesimal points of light, pure life, invisibly vibrating in this universe while it was still devoid of the perversion of the war of guilt and murder and rape were inconceivable sins, but hardly original. And before living in shame of every kind of nakedness became an unholy duty and greed became the only acceptable truth propagated by greedy fools who had the nerve to declare theirs the only rule, the unbreakable rule for everyone else but themselves to live by, we were there. I say we were there their offspring of another dimension and we dance. Yet we dance resplendently wrapped in the exquisite beauty of all the colors of each and every rainbow that had ever been we when nature smiled. Gardens prayed to the rhythm of our tears and got drunk on the musical euphoria of our vibrations. Dizzy from our spinning, but spinning and spinning and spinning we dance, we dance and dance and dance before our fullness became intimidated. And our fullness intimidated the emptiness. The destruction of peace was considered natural. A long time before the power of joy and still fear in the joyless and the always changing constant motion of existence terrified the already petrified, we were there. I say, we were there, we were there, we were there before cowardly fear of the unknown ate the spiritually blind alive and the universe regurgitated the sadness of their negativity, spit it all out into some far away intellectual uh, compost post just another mound of fertilizer lost in time and we were there 
I say we were there. We were there listening, 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 witnessing as we danced. A couple of brazen cosmic peak freaks watching the rebirth of nature's phenomenon of true unification, the inevitable repollination of the one watching, 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 watching as it reaches out as it always does and pulls itself together. And then it all begins again and 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 again we were there that's on a cd with uh the uh uh the great uh 17 piece jazz band electric squeeze box orchestra please check it out help support our starving artists but thank you so much for including me in this wonderful wonderful group of beautiful poets and what can i say i'm going to put our poetry series in the chat please come and check us out as well thank you thank you uh, this is we have one last poet and that's Devor Major. And after that, as we always do, we open the lines so you all can talk to each other. And so I want to welcome Devor Major. I, I thank God for each one of you as a poet because just having the luxury, because I consider po poetry, well, not just a luxury, it's, it's like breath. It's very much needed to survive. And Devore Major's poetry is very much needed as everyone here. Devore served as a San Francisco's third poet laureate and her current book poetry collection is Califia's Daughter published by Willow Books. I'd like you to give a warm welcome to Devore Major. Hi Devore. Hi, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually doing three pieces from the book. I, Kim, thank you for putting together, not just today, which is incredible, but the, the three month series and for everything you do, because you do so many other things. And it's always an honor to be a part of anything you're producing and to be with all these other wonderful voices. So three pieces, creation paradox. We hold the great, great grandparents of our ancestors grandparents, in our bloodstreams, in our stomachs, in our hearts. Thousands of years rest inside our soul. In those years lives the record of our beginning. It is the sweetest marrow in our spine, the cleanest shine in our eyes, the open side of our laughter. You can read it in the lines on the soles of our feet. When we came from, we draw back tree branches to find hidden fruits that we savor, pointed thorns which make us bleed, the yesterdays that led to here, the here's that lead to tomorrow. When we go back to the beginning, we find the stars. In the beginning, there was a time we all say when we were not, after that time, we became, we were created, we were molded, we were spat out, we were sung into until we learned how to make, what to form, where to spit, why to sing. But once, long ago in the beginning, there was only one. And from that one, others were born. And out of those many came us. That is the story we all tell. But before that beginning, before the in the beginning, beginning, when we were born, there must have been another beginning. Before the spider crafting web laying 16 eggs, before the mountain birthing lovers birthing children, before the sky settling low to mate with earth, before light, before darkness, before breath, even there must have been another beginning. It is a beginning that lives in a place we call unknowable, yet it is braided into our genealogies. And it is said it is in that beginning, the beginning before our beginning, it is there that you must go if you want to find the faces of God. Thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years rest inside our souls. And um, this, which is another reiteration of what another, many of 
the poets today have said of who and what we are, because we are indeed the universe too. We are this place. We are this place, the clay and salt of it, the river and sand of it. Fingers rise from desert dunes, faces emerge from cresting waves, bodies unfold like tropical blossoms, flush with the odors of honey and decay. We are the forest we fell, the mountains we devour, the lands we poison. Our bodies are the seed and ash of this place. We are not merely the caretakers of this place. We are this place, this place of gold and silt. And what will we do with this gift and debt? Where in prayer is the space for truth? Where amidst these interminable wars is the table of compassion set? Even in our worm selves as we turn and spit, fertilizing the future with our waste, we are so much more than we imagine. We are spirit resilient, rock unforgiving, wind eternal. Let us move now from the storms of hate and fear and cleanse this place that is us. Sacrifice nothing but our arrogance and the need to destroy and subvert the glories of the universe that are us. We are more than we have imagined, more than we have invented and discovered inside our pulsing dreams. Sing with me of a better day when we learn this planet as ourselves, full of the freshness of a newborn's eyes. We are this place shaping its tomorrows. We need to dream it well. And I'd like to end with stardust. Out of clay they caution, dust to dust they intone. From earth you came and to earth you will return, they admonish. They remind us we are mortal and subject to death, yet insist on their eternals. Demons and angels, paradise or purgatory, merely human with a finite number of days. But we have exploded as novas, burned through galaxies, explored far reaches of the Milky Way, written on the tail of comets, danced on the edge of asteroids, until in a dizzying frenzy of passion we fell through the viscous ozone, past cooling clouds to settle in the ooze that feeds the ocean's floor. It was there that we decided to grow limbs and tongue, all the while holding inside the truth of our origin, magnesium, calcium, copper, iron. We are the stuff that stars are made of. It's a scientific fact, a cosmic trust in ignorance and in knowing, we hold grains of the divine inside ourselves, and we always have. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness, this has been just amazing. I want to make sure that if, if you're here today and in and you heard a poet, give a shout out to that poet. If you'd like to give a shout out, I wanna give a shout out to everyone. This has been, this has been a joy. And so everyone, you should all be on, on mute. Feel free to say hello. Hello. What a hello. wonderful hey, hey. Hey. Hello, everyone. Good to hear you. Shout out to Manon. Thank you so much. There was love. Shout out to Manon. Yes, shout out to the guys. 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 Shout out to
everybody. Thank you for such great poetry. I'm coming at you from the first capital in North Carolina. <laughs> Thank you all for joining in. It's just such a wonderful to have us all here, our people together. to be a black woman, what it means even to be poor. I've had so many people tell th their kids, we didn't even know we were poor because we had a mother <laughs> and a father or a mom. Yeah. <laughs> and so when we were told no, we, were poor, we were in shock. And so people saying that they felt at a certain age, they became into awareness that they were black because they just saw themselves as this wonderful human being on the planet. And then they were labeled. And one of the things I think we're looking at as a people, as a planet, is going beyond labels, going beyond what is seen as who we are. And I think one of the things I love about this black, black speculative arts is it opens up territory. I don't know how many of you have ever been told that you don't write like a black person or you <laughs> don't, yeah, or, or yeah, you're writing about the stars. Do black people write about that? Yeah. And uh, we, we're learning. Ask Winnie Brooks and Jesse Fawcett. <laughs> right, right. But, but we're learning. We're beyond <laughs> the labels put on us. And if anyone wants to even talk about that, because I know sometimes being a writer, particularly a writer of color, can be painful. Mm. Yeah. Let me say this, right oh, I, say this right quick. Go ahead. I'll say this right quick. I think within the context of what our reading was today, what you got was a host of various, very strong ongoing traditional aesthetics that uh, have been operative in our literature and especially our poetry for we could even say two centuries. But the other aspect of it is there are more contemporary genres that were also represented. What I'm gonna always default back to though is, is Devorah because it's inescapable. We are all stardust. And so it starts there. And then from there, it becomes more expansive. If you can even expand on that in any way, shape and form. She hit the nail on the head. There's no running away from the dust to dust. We're not talking about dirt, baby. We're talking about <laughs> the stars. And so I think if you start there with the stars, everything that exists, within that context, planets, even planets like Earth and the life forms on it, including the life forms like us, are fair game for expression, fair game for definition, fair game for exploding uh, those definitions. And that's what we've done today. And I've, I've truly enjoyed it. I'm here in North Carolina, originally from Washington, DC. But I just wanna say again, thanks to Kim, thanks to all the poets that have read I'm still celebrating my birth month with having just celebrated my birthday on Friday. So I've got a jet to continue to do more of that. But I want to say I look forward to seeing you all and hearing you all into the new year and as this century progresses. Everyone uh, struggle up. And when you get there, reach up and pull somebody up there with you. Right. And give thanks. I give true, truly, truly give thanks. And thank you so much, Devora. Yeah. Wow. I did not even address all the poems dealing with stars in my book, Synchronicity, because these, the things that had to be mentioned about what we go through daily, what people have, um, and what all of you have mentioned on some level, the sensitivities, the empaths that we are as a people, 
it, it just had to be discussed and shared. But I give thanks to uh, you, Kim, you did such a marvelous job and uh, thanks everyone. It was just totally amazing. And I, I tried to stay within a, a confine of, of a few minutes. I did do that seven minutes, but um, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. you I, I wanna thank our audience. We have the best audiences, everyone, because half our audience are poets. You know, <laughs> Leonard, do you have something to say? Yes, I want to say some. I just want to say that I'm grateful to all of you and to Kim for putting on this program and for including me. But I wonder, can you imagine what a black poet might hear who write haiku? That's going to be 39 years I've been writing haiku, so can you imagine? Oh, yeah. Uh, think about it. But, oh, yeah. But I kept writing, and that's what I want you to do. That's what we keep writing. writing. That's right. And uh, but yeah, you can imagine some of those things. Good we get them. Oh, oh, uh, hi. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to, to all the, the poets. Um, my eyes are open. I'm awake. Um, I'm enjoying this. Uh, this is a new world for me. Poetry has never been my thing, but uh, this was this was beautiful. This was inspiring, and I do want to. Um, uh, give a little bit of tribute to the late Chadwick Boseman, who who lived his life as a poem, uh, giving at every turn, suffering in silence, and and still giving more, um, acknowledging those who came before him, uh, being inspiration for those who came after him. Um, uh, the Tales of Wakanda, coming out in February, is a tribute to him. Uh, it's the brainchild of um, Jesse um, Holland, who is the editor who put together such incredible writers, uh, some that you don't know who are unbelievable, some that you do know, Nikki Giovanni, uh, Chris Chambers, um, the, the, the power of some of the stories in this, this uh, book upcoming are just unbelievable. I've had a, um, the privilege of seeing them ahead of time, but uh, they're gonna be amazing. You, you're gonna be blown away. Thank you, Glenn. I, I appreciate you, Glenn, so much. Oh, Avacha? <laughs> no, I really, I'm in awe of everybody. And I'm very grateful because I, that when you asked that question about the, when the people have the audacity to come up, you don't write like a black poet or black poets don't, black people don't think about. So how can they tell us what black people are thinking since they are not black people? But anyway, and the truth of the matter, I'm so glad so many people touched on all of those things that they supposedly say we don't think about. Uh, as, as people, black people, brown people, red people, yellow people, we're earth people. And we still believe that the earth is alive and we believe in the trees being, a, a, the, 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 the being that trees are, that dogs and cats are, that the stars are, and we're all part of it. Uh, so it really makes me feel very sad when people fall into the trap of believing that nonsense and, and you know, like making fun of country folks. If it wasn't for the folks in the country, we wouldn't be here. You know, we would not be here. The country folks are the backbone of every single one of us. Every piece of cotton they pick, every cane field they chop down, you know, every corn field they, you know, they, they nourish. We're part of that. And we can't be real and we can't be ourselves until not only do we deal with that, accept that, but we are part of the earth. As Deborah says, so I love that poem. It's one of my favorite poems of all times that start us because we're part of it. We are not the rulers of it. We did not begin it. We will not end it. We are just a small little tiny molecule, a part of something much bigger than we will ever be. But part of that, 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 that equation is those folks, those country folks that make us who we are. We are who we are because of everything they endured and are still enduring because these, these idiots said, oh, you don't think like a black person. Oh, give me a, I am a black person. What, and so I am thinking like a black person no matter what I'm writing about. You know, uh, and, and, and it just makes me very sad when I find too many people who buy into it and actually bully people like me or some of the rest of you who have been doing what we've been doing. People have been talking about Afrofuturism since dirt was dirty. When the people could fly, that's Afrofuturism. You know, Native Americans have been talking about it. Everybody's been talking about it, but now the white folks finally agreed that, oh yes, they are thinking about these things. Give me a break and they can, you know, anyway, sit on a chili and rotate. Anyway, that's enough of me. 
My name's Bean Manzini. I'm a poet from the UK. Um, I'm here because Len, Len Lawson invited a batch of um, us from Obsidian. So it's really such a delicious treat to be amongst such wonderful writers and speakers. And I, I have to say as well that um, to be amongst elders, you know, that is so heartwarming and nourishing and the wisdom that comes from the words and the poetry and everything you have to say in between. I feel so privileged, so blessed. It's midnight here. Um, so I just wanted to give my thanks to you um, before I go, go to sleep. But yeah, thank you everyone involved. Absolutely wonderful. I, I really want to echo and, and amplify what everybody said. It's just, we're such a broad, incredible people. And um, I don't know, sometimes we get confused by all the media and we don't see each other, uh, let alone ourselves as everything we are. And it's things like this that reinforce the wonder. And it's just, what's so beautiful is our diversity within the different ways we are African and, you know, and I agreed with, with everything that Avacha said about country people, but also uh, she has Puerto Rican roots. I have Bahamian roots, you know, and those island people have a, I don't know, part, maybe partly because of the hurricanes or whatever, there's a way they're rooted and not rooted <laughs> and have a kind of humility about the universe because of that. And it's a different kind of Afrocentric, Afrofuturism existence. And I just, I just enjoyed this. I enjoyed it for the breadth and the depth of, of all of it. And it's just been a wonderful, just wonderful. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you. I was invited by my good friends to Jabu. Uh, she and the Straight Out Scribes have been friends of mine for years. And I just wanted to say thank you. I've been writing for 60 years. I'm a poet, a writer, a ghost writer, a public speaker. I've been around Sacramento for a long time. And it has been an honor just to hear each and every one of you. It has been really, really enriching to my soul. And I just wanted to say thank you for being who you are. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you. Thank you. We love you. This is just like listening to some of my heroes. This is great. Thank you. I think it was Eugene Redmond who sent me the message um, for the last one. And I was just telling everybody about it because we're doing a speculative fiction anthology um, uh, later on in the year. So I was just letting them all know that they need to come on to this tonight. So I hope that some of them did. And this has been great. Listening to Devorah Major was brilliant. Um, listening to, because we were kind of studying her, some of her work when I was working with writers, you know, um, in, in London um, about 20 years ago, we were studying some of her work. It was so, this has been really, really amazing to hear and listen to a lot of writers who I really, really have admired for so long. Thank you, Kim, you're wonderful. Absolutely, it's been great. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're we're going to go say goodbye, and I I love you all. I I'm studying honopono the the idea of I love you. I I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And I think it relates to this space in the sense that we as people, when we say I love you and open our hearts up we can accomplish anything. The idea of love generated from us creates a better world. And I think that's what we're doing today. We are generating love and creating a better world. And I know I sound idealistic, I can't help myself. So, <laughs> but I, I appreciate you and I feel like we generated love today. So thank you, I love you. <laughs> okay, so we're out then. Everyone have a beautiful, go ahead, someone said um, I, I got three words, three words. Black is beautiful. Oh, we believe it. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McMillan. That's right, Dr. McMillan. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. McMillan. Thank you, Dr. Judy, we didn't even hear from you today. What's wrong? I'm listening. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Pearl out there.
<laughs> Thank you. Much respect. I love you all and see you see you in the stars. Thank Bye. you, Kim McMillan. Thank Bye. you so much. And thank Bye. you for all the poets. Thank you, Kim. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.